Today, we'll be speaking with Josh Dubin, who is a defense attorney and ambassador advisor for the Innocence Project, a criminal justice reform advocate and also host of the podcast Wrongful Conviction Junk Science. Uh, Josh, it's so great to have you on today. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So to, just to start with, um, can you talk a little bit about how you ended up working uh, in the area of uh, wrongful conviction and, and sort of the path that led you to that? Sure. Um, you know, I'd always been interested in um, criminal justice reform. And I got a call when I was like in my late 20s. I had this odd path because I was known as a jury um, as a, a jury expert. So I would get hired by criminal defense lawyers to help them pick juries. Um, and that was the way it started and, and some civil attorneys as well. So I got a call from Barry Sheck, um, who I had known from watching the O.J. Simpson trial when I was in college. Um, I actually thought it was my brother pranking me. Um, so I'd never return the call. And then the person that the person that referred me called me, uh, his name is Jerry Lefcourt, um, who was, you know, a civil rights icon. He represented the, the Panther 21, the black, black Panthers at that, that their famous trial and Abby Hoffman. And um, he called me and said, what, what's your problem? I refer you to Barry Sheck and you don't call him back. So I called him back and. Um, I met Barry and helped him with the case, and um, it sort of took off from there. Shortly thereafter, Barry, Sheck, and Peter Newfield had a civil practice, a civil rights practice, um, where they were beginning to represent people that they had helped exonerate through the, at the Innocence Project in their civil suits. And I began working with him, and we really hit it off, and it, it sort of took off from there. So big, big picture, um, you can find all sorts of different reports that that uh, claim one in 25 people on death row is innocent or some percentage. You know, there's all the sort of different numbers that, that are applied, uh, generally speaking, to, to folks who have been convicted and, and are in prison. What is a good way for the layperson to wrap their mind around what portion of people convicted for serious crimes? Um, are 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 actually innocent of those crimes? Um, you know, it's difficult to tell because you don't know how many people are out there until you take on their cases. So I don't put much stock into the statistics, but I'll give you one that I do put a lot of stock into. And, and this is only dealing with one state. You know, the state of Florida has 29 exonerations off of death row. 29. Um, they have only executed 99 people in the state of Florida. So I'm a shitty math student, but if you do the quick math, that shows you that a staggering percentage of people that were sitting on death row awaiting execution um, were actually innocent. I mean, I was the lead attorney for Clemente Aguirre, who is the 29th exoneree from death row, and I'm currently representing James Daly, who I think should be the 30th exoneree. Um, he's either going to be the 30th exoneree or the 100th person executed. Um, so I, I hope it's the former and not the latter. And I'm working real hard with my team to make sure that that um, isn't the case or that, that, you know, that it is the case that he gets exonerated. But look, the, it's hard to know what percentage. I would venture to say that it's much higher than people think. And, and it's a scary number um, because even one innocent person sitting on death row is too much. So in interviews and documentaries I've seen about the Innocence Project uh, and, and with Barry and Peter, one of the things that seems very important in. So to set the context, the Innocence Project gets far more requests than the number that they can take in, in terms of the number of cases that can be handled. Many of these cases take 
years uh, uh, to, to be resolved. So there's a there's a selection process that happens there. And certainly it's important how strongly uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You feel that the individual in question is innocent. But w- how much of the calculus, again, given that there are limited resources and a limited number of cases you can take, how much of the calculus is about the likelihood that you could actually get a, a, a conviction overturned? Um, that's a good part of the calculus, you know, and, and different criminal justice reform organizations have different criteria for how um, they go about assessing cases and whether or not they'll take them. You know, I have a little bit more liberty because I don't work at the Innocence Project, although I'm an, I'm an ambassador for the Innocence Project. So sometimes I take on Innocence Project cases and that they're they're my first love, if you will. Um, but. You know, I can say that different people do this work for different reasons. Some people take a look at a case and say, you know what, there are terrible um, legal violations here, uh, constitutional violations, and that if, you know, there's something worth fighting for here, irregardless of their assessment of a person's guilt or innocence. Um, And for me, that's important. Um, And it's also important. to me, you know, I think that, look, we're human beings. Um, I think that the more I feel that someone is innocent, the harder I think I'll fight, whether on a conscious or, or subconscious level. So I think that um, likelihood of success is definitely a factor. But I can tell you that all of these exonerations are a, an arduous Um, battle, a steep uphill climb. You're fighting against very tall odds. Um, So um, I hope that that was a long winded way of answering your question. Yeah. I mean, how how much does um, a gut instinct factor into your belief about a possible case, a a, a possible uh, a person you'll represent a client's guilt or, or innocence? How much of it is gut and how much of it is reviewing the facts? I try not to let my gut um, lead me in one direction or another, and I try to to, to um, base it on on facts or or absence of facts. And there's a very there's a very particular reason why I, I sort of ascribe to that. And and why? What is that? Because it's gut. It's the gut of of detectives and law enforcement. Some some oftentimes. Um, well-intentioned but extraordinarily misguided that leads to the wrongful um, accusation in the first place, which leads to the coerced confession, which leads to making up evidence to make the the um, ends justify the means that, you know, it's a, it's a very dangerous path to go down um, because I'm often humbled by evidence or the lack of evidence that conflicts with my gut. So I try not to let my gut get too involved. And because, I, again, I think that, you know, it's oftentimes detectives um, feel like in their gut that if a spouse is murdered, it's the surviving spouse that, is, that did it. And they start focusing on them because that's their gut. And it can lead to tunnel vision and confirmation bias and a whole host of problems that um, are, are a pretty... Um, terrifying, slippery slope for the accused. There are a very long list of of reasons and different ways in which innocent people can end up convicted. And as you're talking about uh, tunnel vision from investigators can be a way where where somebody becomes the suspect relatively early on at the exclusion of, of maybe others. Um, junk science is another um, uh, aspect of this. And um, for example, forensic dentistry is one that's been explored significantly and has been involved in, in a lot of uh, uh, retrials or, or um, exonerations. Can you talk a little bit about how would you sort of categorize the, the different uh, buckets that would be the main ways in which innocent people end up convicted? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, one of the things, it's also a natural segue for me to plug the podcast, but, you know, on our podcast, Wrongful Conviction Junk Science, we explore a different discipline of junk science on every episode. And it's not something that I'm plucking out of thin air. Um, I am doing it 
in large part based on the National Academy of Sciences report in 2009 that examined these various disciplines of forensic dentistry and essentially found that the only one um, that that is reputable and has any bankable, reliable science behind it is DNA. So we examine everything from bite marks, as you mentioned, forensic dentistry, to arson, to, um, you know, uh, footwear impressions, to ballistics, to gunshot residue, to fingerprints. Think about that. We have always been taught in pop culture, on true crime shows, that fingerprints are the gold standard, and they're not. Um, and if you really examine any of these um, disciplines of forensic science, you find out that even attaching the word forensic to it or calling it a science is a misnomer because many of them are born in, in basements and, and at, at the hands of some crackpot that did not get um, even minimal buy-in from the scientific community, um, much less apply the scientific method. And they get accepted in one case. And because of our, our system of legal precedent, they all, all, all of a sudden start spreading through the justice system. And, you know, we get these, um, you know, various forms of, of alleged science that um, you, you need a 40-hour correspondence course to get declared an expert in and, you know, you, you end up with with real problems. Is there an, an asymmetry with with a lot of this where, as you mentioned, once a certain type of so-called science is accepted in a case, it becomes precedent for its future use. But on the other hand, correct me if I'm wrong, if if such a, a so-called science is found to be unreliable in one particular case, there's no automatic process where previous convictions are automatically reviewed. It's up to you to actually bring these on a one on a one on one basis. Is that is my understanding correct? Yeah, that's basically it. And it takes. Look, this 2009 report by the NAS should have been a bombshell. It was in the scientific community. It should have been in the legal community. And what it takes is attorneys with the fight in them um, and, and the, um, you know, the wherewithal to do the research and to challenge it. But that's only half of it. It also takes a judge that has the courage to not just follow legal precedent, but to take a fresh look at it. And oftentimes that's a real sticking point. Um, judges like to follow legal precedent. They don't like to upset it. Um, and it really takes, you know, attorneys, um, you know, really beating the drum, if you will, as often as they can and as much as they can to try everything in their toolbox to open the eyes of judges and to get them to take a fresh look. Um, you know, we could take bite marks, for instance. I mean, as a threshold matter, the case that allowed bite marks into our criminal justice system, the appellate court said there's no science here. There's no way to replicate it. But who are we to upset what the trial court judge did? Well, you're an appellate court. That's exactly what you're there to do. But nonetheless, they allowed it in. And, you know, think about this, David, there's no they, they got the, the professed best odontologists in the country. Odontologists are these people that fancy themselves forensic experts that can, you know, match up teeth to a bite mark. They couldn't even agree on whether or not a mark on human skin was from human teeth. Um, and, you know, if you can't agree to that, you can, you know, envision what some of the, the, the problems are downstream. But, you know, they have found in studies that in reputable studies that are cited in the NAS report that somebody could be missing their front teeth and bite down on human skin. And it appears as if you do indeed have two front teeth and people can have two front teeth and bite down. And it appears that they don't have two front teeth because of the size of their incisors. Um, so it's a it's a, a science that's fraught with problems, as are many of these disciplines of forensic science. A couple other things I wanted to ask about when it comes to a confession from someone to a crime that they did not commit. And when you are working a, a, such a case, 
um, after a conviction, how you overcome that. Can you talk a little bit about why people would confess to a crime they didn't commit? It's very common for individuals to say, I would never do that. I would just simply never do that if put in a, in a, a situation like that. What is it that that person can't understand about how these things end up happening? Yeah, you know, it's probably the most important question I've been asked. Um, and certainly, you know, you put your finger, David, on sort of the nerve root of the most challenging issue that I have studied for almost 20 years now. Um, you can say that until, God forbid, you're put in the position. And, you know, the breakthrough that I have had in getting people to understand it is to get them into the interrogation room mentally to understand what's going on. And we are going to explore the, the flawed or the perversion of that psychology in an upcoming episode of Wrongful Conviction Junk Science, the tactics that are used. Um, but it is a very, very, very effective um, combination of, of physical abuse. And, and I don't mean just beating someone up, but um, and psychological tactics that are employed to get someone to confess and you know it starts with getting them in a chair in a in a room where there are no windows and cutting them off from their support system so you don't give them access to contact friends or family members or to make a phone call and you give them this illusion that they're in custody and a breaking down process occurs sometimes over many hours or even many days where you cut people off from their um, ability to contact the outside world. You start threatening them. You are permitted in the American criminal justice system to lie to them and to start telling them that their DNA has been found on something and what would be the possible explanation for that um, or that we have found a tool um, where we've been able to match the markings on it to a tool in your garage and you know what's your explanation for it. And so it's a combination of that and lying to them um, about what the implications are if they don't play ball. Um, oftentimes, they're able to convince people that their memory may not be um, as accurate as they think it is. And when you start to hear that your fingerprints have been found somewhere and your DNA has been found somewhere, um, you start to question your own sanity. And it doesn't happen right away. Sometimes it happens after you've been deprived of sleep, after you've been yelled at and screamed at, um, after you have been deprived of food, um, after you have been told, you know, if you don't confess to this, someone very close to you is going to suffer some serious consequences. Like if you don't play ball with us, um, somebody else is going to suffer. Trying to make people feel like they are part of the investigation team. Um, how would somebody go about? So if I said to you, David, that, you know, your fingerprints were found on the murder weapon, can you give us some reasons why that could be? And then you might say something innocent like, well, I do. I have used that knife before, you know, to cut vegetables in the kitchen. Um, and then all of a sudden they have these they have these things that they can use against you later on. And they say, well, you did tell us you touched the knife. And how are you going to prove that it was the time you cut the vegetables and not last night? Fingerprints don't have a time marking on them. And it's just this constant breaking down process. And for many people that, that um, falsely confess, the thinking isn't, okay, I'll admit it because I actually did it. The thinking is these people are not going to accept my explanation that I had nothing to do with this for an answer. And now I'm scared. And now I'm, I, I'm, it's become apparent to me that they're not going to take no for an answer. So I'm going to tell them what they want to hear, get out of this room and sort it out later. Mm. You know, I have had many clients who the first thing they did when they left an interrogation room was go to a lawyer, was go right to a law firm, was to write a letter saying I only did that because of what was done to me in the interrogation room. So it's it's in order to get people to understand it, you have to bring them through it in painstaking detail. Um, I just gave you sort of a, a, an overview, but we are going to be speaking to David Rudolph, who's a really famous criminal defense and civil rights lawyer. He was the, the um, um, 
featured in the Netflix series The Staircase, and he has done a lot of coerced confession cases, and we're really going to dive into it in, you know, in an episode a few weeks from now. So that'll be in an upcoming episode of Wrongful Conviction Junk Science. We've been speaking with Josh Dubin, who's an attorney and also host of the podcast, Wrongful Conviction Junk Science. Josh, I so appreciate your time. The The work is fascinating and, and important, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's such an important um, issue, and I hope um, you know your viewers are inspired to watch, to listen to the podcast.